Hey everyone, welcome back to the Cast Sphere Podcast. My name is John, and today we have back on the show Erica Nelson, the host of the Awkward Angler Podcast and a fly fishing guide out of Colorado. Today we are going to talk about how she got better at fishing through a not so not so average way, or I don't know how to phrase it, but it's pretty unique. So welcome back to the show, Erica. Hey, thanks. So you're telling me that one thing that really helped you get started really early was hopping on the dating apps and you know going out fishing and and learning from the guys uh that you're dating so can you talk about some of that yeah totally uh so back in college i was actually doing a research project on measuring online dating profiles and narcissism and so i was kind of (laughs) like really getting into like hey you know these pictures of these people that are putting up like um you know they have a lot of confidence in themselves so i wonder if i can measure narcissism so I, as you know, due to my research, I had gone on all these dating apps. And one of the things that I noticed on specific, uh, specifically on Tinder was there was a lot of men holding fish. <laughs> There's a lot of profile pictures of guys holding their trophy trout. So, you know, I thought, you know, how I also wanted to get into fishing at the same time. You know, I utilized YouTube, um, I think for as long as I could. And I just wasn't, I just wanted to get better. You know, I just wasn't really catching anything. I had a lot of questions. Um, You know, I didn't really know anybody um, in the area that I live that could help me. So I thought, you know, what would it be like if I just swiped right on every single guy holding a fish? (laughs) And, you know, once (laughs) that, (laughs) once I started to to match with these people, you know, I then would bombard them with all of my questions of, hey, I just got into fly fishing, you know, can you tell me the difference between this rig setup or like, how do you utilize a streamer more effectively? Um, and then eventually they ended up just inviting me to go fishing. And, you know, I was pretty upfront of what I was doing, you know, like I'm really utilizing this time and this space and this meetup to really improve my technique and skills, you know, and if it happens to be a connection, great, I'm single, but at the same time, my primary goal is to kind of um, learn from, from different professionals in the space. And so I ended up getting access to a lot of fly fishing guides um, that really just kind of took the time to like hang out and, um, you know, um, learn new tricks of the trade and really kind of helped honed in my skills, you know, with casting, fly selection, etymology, um, and then different rowing techniques as well. So I come from a whitewater boating background. And whenever you're fishing from a drift boat, it's just a little bit more of a different type of rowing style. And so I really got some access to to that type of lesson as well as different waterways as well. And then ultimately, I've gained a lot of great friendships. I'm still really close with all those those folks that I met <laughs> online that are still uh, a part of my life today. That um, yeah, when every time I'm back in Wyoming or wherever we met, we to- totally try to go fishing. <laughs> So you sound like you've done some of the the data analysis behind this. Did you see that the bigger the fish, the the better techniques that they had, or like what <laughs> what did you figure out in that whole experiment? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a that's a really funny question. But now that I'm kind of looking at it, yeah, I would say the bigger the fish, the more like technically like um, engaged they were <laughs> in their in their technique. And so when they met somebody that also wanted to learn about their expertise, they were super stoked and and really helpful um, in helping my style and and getting better at fishing. <laughs> when you talked to them, did they mention that those pictures? got them dates or was it something like they thought it would get them dates but you know you were the only one who really swiped right (laughs) that's a good question i would say no that question didn't come up but i my here's my like my analysis or observation is I would say most men don't in in general do not take photos of themselves nor have pictures of themselves in like regular life situations you know they're not instagramming themselves going out to dinner um you know the only time that is acceptable in this culture is to take photos of your fish right and that is pretty um 
like it's almost like routine, <laughs> you know, it's like what you do in fly fishing. It's how you connect with other anglers. And I think that's the only opportunity that the phone comes out and the pictures are taken. And so that happens to be the only photo they have when they go to sign up for an online dating site. And so I think it just kind of, <laughs> that's just kind of how it happens. I don't think that they're thinking that, oh, this is going to get me a girl. I think that's just the only photo that they have available that they need to upload something. <laughs> Now, did you call them out on geotagging with those uh, Tinder profile pictures? Because, you know, people get up in arms about it. You know, you're the one who's like, you're blowing up your spot, bro. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting conversation when it comes to geotagging. It's more of a, it's a good conversation to have, you know. Um, you know, talking to you previously about different areas in Colorado, there's, you know, the internet that has a great list of rivers and waterways that are accessible for, for folks that aren't familiar with fishing in Colorado, you know, and I'd say information is, is good, um, as well as conservation is also good. And so what are our intentions behind geotagging? And so I met different guides and different, you know, anglers that have different perceptions of, you know, never do it. Um, others to like, hey, why not? You know, this is, um, not my, not me to, to keep secret, <laughs> you know, this is a land and waterways that we all share. So I'm going to share it with, with everybody, but I think there's a balance there. I found a balance and I, I've noticed that other guides and anglers that I meet also find their balance as well. So yeah, it just depends on who you meet really. <laughs> if you had to distill that topic down to kind of like best practices or rules of thumb, is it, you know, don't put the GPS coordinates, you know, out and about, but feel free to take a picture or pull her out the background or what, what should people who are kind of, cause this is what I've, I've seen over here for, especially like spearfishing, right? It's like yeah. everybody gets super excited the first year that they're in, they want to take as many pictures as possible because they're just stoked. And then after like the first year, then they kind of start realizing, you know, maybe I don't need to be like, you know, braggadocious of like this new hobby that I'm in and I'll be a little bit more quiet. But a lot of times, depending on the internet or how savvy tech savvy, they'll be like, just that one year is enough to kind of blow up everything. <laughs> like, oh, here's <laughs> here's the date, timestamp, the location of this and that, and I'm here to share it. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what is some good best practices from your point of view? Yeah, I would say. Um... I would, I would just kind of ask yourself, like, why? Like, why are you doing this? Why is this important for you to geotag this location? Um, you know, is it for the, you know, the bragalicious, right? Is it for, like, what, like why? What is your intention of doing that? Um, is really kind of the question that we don't really stop to ask ourselves. Um, you know, and what does that place mean, not only to you, but maybe the culture that's there, um, you know, and kind of also having some reverence around, hey, we're actually all living on stolen indigenous lands and so this is not really anybody's to protect other than the original stewards so it kind of just depends on where your mindset is and your intentions behind that that a lot of people don't really reflect on and so really just kind of asking yourself why why am I doing this um what's the access you know I definitely um I do geotag um some of the main rivers that I fish because that is worldly known <laughs> you know the frying pan is no secret uh taylor river is no secret the gunnison's no secret and so um you know as far as getting really specific um you know what are the odds that somebody is going to go there and catch the same fish with the same you know time stamp etc um likely not going to happen and so um it's just kind of a balance right i would say so one of again we're kind of recapping ask yourself why i know what's the impact of the culture around there if anything right you know and i like your point of you know newbies really getting excited about it um and really just kind of checking that a little bit of hey um you know, it take a, it might have taken some other anglers' work to get access to that point. You know, maybe they were um, doing some mitigation in, in the construction of the area or or whatnot for you to be able to access that spot, and then you're going to go blow it up. So just kind of having more knowledge and understanding of where you're recreating is going to be really helpful in making that decision. Yeah, that's that's a great point because it's for me. I've seen that a lot of, especially the old timers they're very free to tell you where to go and what to do, you know, but it usually comes from you approaching them and being like, Hey, I really want to get better. Or I really respect what you've been up to, um, you know, and, and they're free to give it. But I think the issue comes when you kind of just either bypass that or 
you know, take that information and then just like put a megaphone on it. You know, it's like, it's, it's a little touchy, right? Cause it's like not everybody has access to these older guys, you know, or, or yeah. they don't vibe with that, with the younger person, you know? So it's like, it, it goes back to that other conversation of like, are there barriers, uh, you know, and privileges of certain things, you know, that allow access to information. So it's, it's a very complicated situation, but I think yeah. being human and being, uh, a little more reserve could probably benefit everybody a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'd say like, it's very human of us to um, have some sort of like sense of entitlement or presumption of access. And I think whenever we're denied something, it is, um, it's shocking. <laughs> and it's like, I should have access to all of these things, you know? And, you know, for example, there was a pyramid Lake that shut down last year and that's located on indigenous lands and on the, on a reservation. And when it shut down due to COVID, there was some anger or anglers that were super angry of, Hey, I've always had access to pyramid Lake. Why are you shutting this down? I should have pre this presumption of access and I should, you know, um, do X, Y, Z to, to <laughs> access this area. But really that's not for, um, that, that was for the tribe to kind of make that call and that decision and you know kind of respecting that and checking our own um our own presumption and and our own self-entitlement and self-righteousness is a good is a good check to have <laughs> no i think that's a perfect place to end it uh tomorrow will be our last episode we're going to be talking about diversity and how to navigate awkward conversations thanks for being on the show erica Hey, one more thing before you go. If you're on the socials, you know, the Instagrams, the TikToks, the other platforms, follow us. Say hi. At Cast and Spear all over the place. That's at C-A-S-T-A-N-D-S-P-E-A-R. I'll see you over there. Chat soon.